Welcome back to my channel. If you are a new visitor on this channel, you are also highly welcome. This is the part two lecture on the Anna Canal. I have done the part one lecture on the Anna Canal where I discussed about the internal war of the Anna Canal. You can go and check that lecture up to keep yourself updated. But for the purpose of this lecture, we'll be focusing on the Anna Sphinctas. So ride on with me as I unfold the anatomy of the Anna Sphinctas. <laughs> So this lecture, we'll be looking at the anal sphincters. The anal sphincters are muscular bands that are seen to surround the anal canal. So they are seen like a ring to surround the wall of the anal canal. So let's say this is the configuration of the anal canal highlighted here. So this anal canal will be seen to be surrounded by muscular bands that are referred to anal sphincters. So we have two anal sphincters. We have the internal anal sphincter and we have the external anal sphincter. So going back to this configuration here that we projected, on the internal part, we have muscular band that is seen to surround the wall of the anal canal. And this is the internal anal sphincter, just as the name implies. And external to this internal anal sphincter, we have the external anal sphincter, and this is the external anal sphincter. So you can see that the anal sphincters are seen as muscular bands surrounding the wall of the anal canal. Using this image down here, this is the rectum, and we know that inferior to the rectum, we have the anal canal, and this is the anal canal here, marked in white. And around the wall of the anal canal, we have the internal anal sphincters, as we described before, that is seen as a muscular band that surrounds the wall of the anal canal. And this is the internal anal sphincter here, arrowed in yellow. And external to the internal anal sphincter, we have the external anal sphincter, and this is the external anal sphincter here, arrowed in red. It is good to state here that this image down here is a vertical longitudinal section, and that is why the internal and the external anal sphincter are presented in this way. But just for us to know that these sphincters are seen to encycle the wall of the anal canal. But because it is opened or exposed here, that is why it is presented this way. So we see that the anal sphincters are seen to surround the wall of the anal canal, just as it is projected in this image. So going further, let's look at the functions of the anal sphincters. What the anal sphincters do? The anal sphincters have to control the process of defecation. The process of defecation is under the control of anal sphincters. The anal sphincters, as expressed in our previous slide, are seen as muscular bound that surround the wall of the anal canal. And as they surround the wall of the anal canal, they are seen as a guide that helps to control the passage of substances through the lumen of the anal canal. So that is why they help to control the process of defecation. So they can decide to either contract or relax. When they contract, they would prevent the passage of feces through the lumen of the anal canal. And when they relax, there's going to be the allowance of the passage of feces through the lumen of the anal canal. So it depends on the situation at hand, whether it is time for physics to be released to the external environment, then they would decide to relax relax so as to allow the easy passage of physics along the lumen of the Hana Kana. They also have to maintain fecal continence, which means that they allow for voluntary elimination of physics. And this means that it prevents the release of physics uncontrollably. We are able to have voluntary control over the release of physics. As we go through with this lecture, we would see that one of the anal sphincters is a voluntary sphincter, which means that we have control over heat, whether it will contract or relax, depending on the situation at hand, which means that the release of physics along the lumen is under control. So those are the functions of the anal sphincters as we've highlighted. So as we've described in our previous slides that the anal sphincters are of two types, we have the internal anal sphincter. Let's say this is the configuration of the anal canal. So around the anal canal, we have muscular bound that is referred to the internal anal sphincter. And this is seen to be located around the wall of the anal canal. So external to the internal anal sphincter, we have the external anal sphincter. And this is the external anal sphincter here that is highlighted. And it's seen to be positioned at the external part of the internal anal sphincter. And this is where the names have been drafted from. So knowing this, let's try and take each of these sphincters one after the other to see what they present in terms of anatomical configuration. 
now going further on the internal Anna Sphincter, we already described that it's seen around the Anna Canal and it's seen to surround the upper or the superior to third of the Anna Canal. Let's say this is the rectum here. We already know that inferior to the rectum, we have the Anna Canal. And this is the Anna Canal here marked in red. So it means the Anna Canal extends from this region where we have the anorectal junction. The anorectal junction is the junction between the rectum and the Anna Canal. And it's seen to terminate at the inferior part where we have the anus or the Anna orifice. The internal anus inter is seen to surround the wall of the anna canal at its superior two third. So the upper two third is where we have the internal anus inter, and this is the internal anus inter here, harrowed in red. You can see it here highlighted in blue. So you see it surrounding the anna canal at the superior two third. It does not extend down. If you look at the inferior one third of the anna canal, the internal anus inter is not seen around that region. So it is seen to surround the superior two third of the anna. And this internal anal sphincter is made up of smooth muscle, which means it is an involuntary type of sphincter, which means that this sphincter is not under voluntary control. We do not have control over this sphincter because it is made up of smooth muscle. So if we try to go back on the configuration of the gastrointestinal tract, we know that the muscular layer of the gastrointestinal tract is made up of the inner circular muscle and the outer longitudinal muscle. So this is the inner circular muscle here, harrowed here in red. And we have the outer longitudinal muscle here harrowed in black. This is the configuration that is presented along the wall of the gastrointestinal tract, which also the rectum and the anal canal form part of. So if you look at this configuration here, you see that the inner circular layer that is arrowed here tend to extend downwards surrounding the wall of the anal canal. And this is where we have the inner circular layer of the gastrointestinal tract being transformed into the internal anal sphincter. That is why we say that the internal anal sphincter is an involuntary type of muscle because it is made up of the smooth muscle fibers. So you see that this extension here of the inner circular layer of the gastrointestinal tract extending downward and also forming a sphincter or a guide or a muscular bound around the wall of the anal canal. And that is what is presented here in this image. And this is what finally forms the internal anal sphincter. So we can say that the internal anal sphincter is a modification of the inner circular layer of the gastrointestinal tract. And this is what is established here. So you see it surrounding the superior to third as we've stated, you do not see the internal anal sphincter at the lower one third of the anal canal. So it's not seen to extend downwards. It's just seen at the upper two third. And you see it as a guide and of course an extension of the inner circular layer of the gastrointestinal tract. So this is what the internal anal sphincter entails. It's also inhabited by autonomic nerves. So it's also good for us to know this. So going further on the external anal sphincter, we already described where the external anal sphincter is located. It is seen at the external part, just as the name implies. The external anal sphincter is then seen to surround the lower to third of the anal canal. So this is the external anal sphincter here, harrowed in black. You can see where it is positioned on the external part of the anal canal, and it is seen to be located external to the internal anal sphincter that we described in our previous slide. So this is the external anal sphincter here, arrowed in black, and you see that this external anal sphincter is seen to surround the anal canal at its inferior or lower two -third. So if you look at the superior one third, you see that the external anal sphincter is not seen around this space. So you see the internal anal sphincter that we described before, surrounding the superior to third hole, leaving a space down here. Why the external anal sphincter is surrounding the lower to third or the inferior to third, leaving the space up here. So you can see that it's like a word and opposite thing. The external anal sphincter is not seen to extend upward, while the internal anal sphincter is not seen to extend downward. So the external anal sphincter is seen to surround the inferior, the lower to third of the anal canal. And it is also of a skeletal or a striated muscle type. So this means that this external anal sphincter is a voluntary type of sphincter where we have a voluntary control of the release of physics because the external anal sphincter is a voluntary type of sphincter that we have power over its control. So we decide to hold the physics until where it is convenient for us, then we can decide to now relax it so that there will be easy passage of physics.
Out of the two anal sphincters, the external anal sphincter is the particular one that is responsible for maintaining fecal continence, which is the voluntary control of the release of physics. And this we have highlighted in our previous slide when we try to establish the functions of the anal sphincters. And this is where we experience times when the physics is almost coming to the outside, but we are still able to have a level of control over its release because it is a voluntary type of sphincter. So it is this external anal sphincter that is responsible for this control at this level. So it is innervated by the pudenda nerve, which is a somatic type of innervation. You know that the internal anal sphincter is of autonomic innervation because it is made up of smooth muscle, while the external anal sphincter is made up of sprited or skeletal type of muscle, which is under voluntary control. And this is innervated by the pudenda nerve. So going further on the external anal sphincter, the external anal sphincter is subdivided into three sub parts. So it's like a three in one kind of sphincter. So we have this subcutaneous external anal sphincter. Just from the name, it means it is located close to the skin. And this is the subcutaneous external anal sphincter. So deep to the subcutaneous external anal sphincter, we have the superficial external anal sphincter, and this is the superficial external anal sphincter here, harrowed in green. And deep to the superficial external anal sphincter, we have the deep external anal sphincter, and this is the deep external anal sphincter here, harrowed. In case we are asked during exam, it is divided into three parts. We have the subcutaneous external anal sphincter, we have the superficial external anal sphincter, we have the deep external anal sphincter. Just for us to also do this. So let's go further. We have what is called the intersphincteric groove. This is another interesting part. In order to understand where this groove is created, it is important that we already establish where the internal and the external anal sphincters are located. So this is where we have the intersphincteric groove. The intersphincteric groove is like a depression that is created at a point where we have the limit of the internal anal sphincter and also where it forms an intercept with the external anal sphincter. Remember in our previous slide where we described the internal and the external anal sphincter, we said that the internal anal sphincter surrounds the superior to third of the anal canal, while the external anal sphincter surrounds the inferior to third of the anal canal. Definitely there's going to be a point where they are going to form an intercept. So the region where they form an intercept is where we have this depression created. And this is what is referred to as the intersphincteric group. Remember we said this is the internal anal sphincter here, arrowed in yellow, surrounding the superior to third of the anal canal. And if you see it at the upper part extending down, is at this point is where we have the lower end of the internal anal sphincter. And we said that this is the external anal sphincter here, harrowed in purple. The external anal sphincter also surrounds the anal canal at its lower or inferior to top. And you see it has turning down to the point where we have the, the anal orifice. There's a region where the lower limit of the internal anal sphincter forms an intercept with the external anal sphincter. So there's a depression or a group that is created around this region. And this is the region here harrowed in black. This groove is palpable during digital rectal examination. So when there's contraction of the perineal muscles, there's going to be a depression that will be palpable around this region. And this depression here is what is referred to as the intersphincteric groove. This intersphincteric groove also tallies with the point where we have the Eltin's white line. This is the Eltin's white line here, harrowed in blue. We already talked about this Eltin's white line or a part one lecture of the anal canal, where we try to describe the internal configuration of the anal canal. If you've not checked that lecture, please kindly go and do so, so as to keep yourself updated. The Eltis white line, we said that it subdivides the lower one third of the anal canal into the middle or the transition zone and also the lowermost region. So the Eltis white line tallies with the level where we have the intersphincteric group. So going further, there are some modifications that are seen around the anal sphincter. We have the inner circular muscle, and this is the inner circular muscle. And external to the inner circular muscle, we have the outer longitudinal muscle. This muscle at the muscular layer of the gastrointestinal tract. We said that this is the rectum. And if you go to the rectum, we have the anal canal. The rectum and the anal canal also form part of the gastrointestinal tract. So we have the extension of the muscular layer of the gastrointestinal tract to the region where we have the rectum and also the anal canal. So we have the inner circular muscle and we have the 
after longitudinal muscle. We already described in our previous slide that the inner circular muscle is continuous downwards along the wall of the inner canal. And this is what transformed to become the internal anal sphincter. And this is where we have the transformation here. And this is referred to as the internal canal sphincter. So for the outer longitudinal layer, that is harrowed here in yellow, we have a number of transformation that it does around the anal sphincter. And it is good for us to highlight this. So you see the outer longitudinal muscle extending down here. It is highlighted here in harsh and also arrowed in yellow. So you see it extending. This is where we have the levator ani muscle. And below the levator ani muscle, you see that there's going to be a thickening of this outer longitudinal muscle. What is responsible for this thickness is because the levator ani muscle also insert a number of its fibers into the outer longitudinal muscle. And that is why you have the thickening of this outer longitudinal muscle. And at this point, it is referred to as the core joint longitudinal muscle. It still retains the name, the longitudinal muscle, but it has a core joint in it because of the thickening that it is seen to present. And this thickness is as a result of fibers of the levator and eye muscle that is inserted onto it. So you have the core joint longitudinal muscle. And this cogent longitudinal muscle also try to present some form of activities around the anal sphincter. So if you see it running down, you see that this cogent longitudinal muscle try to send some of its fibers into the internal anal sphincter. We already described the internal anal sphincter as a modification of the inner circular muscle of the gastrointestinal tract. You see it extending down here, but of course, surrounding the superior two of the anal canal. You see that the cogent longitudinal muscle sends some of its fibers into the internal anal sphincter here, and this is what is harrowed here. So you see a number of fibers, and these fibers are sent deep into the internal anal sphincter, and are being driven into the subcutaneous layer of the anal canal. So this is what is referred to as the submucosa suspensory ligament of PAX. So these fibers here are referred to as the submucosa suspensory ligament of PAX because they are seen to be directed towards the submucosa layer of the anal canal. And that is where the name is being drafted from. To give structural support to the internal anal sphincter. The cogent longitudinal muscle also try to present another form of modification as it is seen to be directed downwards. So as it continues, we see that finally, it will send a number of its fibers also to the subcutaneous external anal sphincter. Remember when we described the subdivisions of the external anal sphincter in our previous slide, we said that we have the subcutaneous external anal sphincter, we have the superficial external anal sphincter, and we have the deep external anal sphincter. So for the subcutaneous external anal sphincter, we have the co-joint longitudinal muscles sending a number of fibers into the subcutaneous external anal sphincter. And this is what is presented around this region. You can see that the co-joint longitudinal muscle finally sends its fibers, inserting it into the subcutaneous external anal sphincter. So the collection of the fiber cell would then be referred to as the corrugator scotis ani muscle. This corrugator scotis ani muscle, we described this muscle in our previous part one lecture on the anal canal, where we said that this muscle is responsible for the formation of the rigged appearance seen at the inferior part of the anal canal. So if you look at the anal canal from the outside, you see this rigged appearance that is formed. This is formed as a result of fibers of the corrugator scotis ani muscle. And we know that this corrugator scotis ani muscle is from the cogent longitudinal muscle. And this cogent longitudinal muscle is a transformation of the outer longitudinal muscle. So if you try to trace these fibers up to where it originates from, you see that it is from the smooth muscle wall of the gastrointestinal tract, which is the outer longitudinal muscle. So that is why we say that it is a thin layer of involuntary muscle. So these fibers of the corrugator scotis ani muscle is an involuntary type of muscle that originates from the outer longitudinal longitudinal muscle of the gastrointestinal tract. Because if you trace it up here, this is the outer longitudinal muscle here that is harrowed in yellow. We said that this muscle would descend down and become transformed or thickened due to the fact that the fibers from the levator and eye muscle will contribute to this thickness and this will be transformed into the co-joint longitudinal muscle. It still retained the name longitudinal, but it's a co-joint type of longitudinal muscle because it now has fibers from the levator and eye muscle. And this is what is harrowed here in green. And this cogent longitudinal muscle for that descent, then finally inserting its fibers 
into the subcutaneous part of the external anal sphincter. And this is what is presented here and harrowed in blue. So these fibers at this point would then be referred to as the corrugator scotus ani muscle. And this is responsible for the rich appearance that is seen in the lower part of the anal canal. We say that when you try to view the anal canal from the outside, you see this rich appearance that is formed. And another interesting fact about the corrugator scotus ani muscle. Now that we know that this muscle is an involuntary type of muscle, you see that at this point, it is seen to be crossed or inserted into a voluntary type of muscle. So you see an involuntary type of muscle inserting into a voluntary type of muscle because we know that the external anal sphincter is a striated or a skeletal type of muscle. And the subcutaneous part of the external anal sphincter is what this corrugator scotus ani muscle inserts on. So this is the interesting presentation of the corrugator scotus ani muscle, where its fibers are of involuntary origin and are seen to be inserted on muscles that are of striated or skeletal type of muscle. So going further, let's look at the pubo rectalis. The pubo rectalis is a U-shaped muscle that is seen to wrap around the anorectal junction. We already described the anorectal junction as the junction between the rectum and also the anal canal, just as the name implies, this is the rectum. And if you're to the rectum, we have the anal canal here. So you see the pubo rectalis wrapping around the anorectal junction and connecting it to the pubic tobacco anteriorly. So this is the pubo rectalis muscle, this is the anterior part, and behind it we have the posterior part. This is where we have the rectum and also the anal canal. Anteriorly, we have the pubic tobacco. This pubo rectalis muscle, together with the anal sphincter, form the anorectal ring. Let's say this is the configuration of the anal canal. We already described the anal sphincter as muscular bands that are seen to surround the anal canal. So we have the internal anal sphincter. The external to this, we have the external anal sphincter. Also, supporting this orientation, supporting this overlap at this region, we have the puborectalis muscle. Puborectalis muscle, seen as a U shaped muscle that wraps around the anorectal junction, connecting it to the pubic tuber. So this is what is called the anorectal ring. So this is the kind of configuration that is presented here. And this is used as a landmark for locating tumor. So it is very important in clinical practice. This thickness is used to establish existence of tumor. So let's go further on clinical anatomy. The clinical anatomy that I would want to highlight is fecal incontinence. And this is not being able to voluntarily hold physics. You do not have power to hold the release of physics. And this will mean that physics will be released uncontrollably. And this can occur as a result of diarrhea, constipation. Also within this lecture that we've presented, there could be damage on the sphincters. Also the nerves that helps to control the action of the sphincters or muscles around it. Let's check our understanding of this lecture through the following question. The first one is to describe the formation of the internal anal sphincter. The second question is, what is the intersphincteric groove? This we have adequately described during the course of this lecture. The third question is to explain the parts or the sub-regions of the external anal sphincter. And the last question is, what is the anorectal ring? So thanks for watching this video. Let's continue to stay glued to this channel. Thank you. Bye.